This is a production of Cornell University. So hi everyone. You can hear me now, right? Okay, I'm Raksha Thapa in uh, Virginia Moore Lab and working on breeding for low temperature tolerance in cover crops. So, so what are cover crops? I think most of you have uh, some idea on the cover crops, but uh, I wanted to give some brief uh, intro. So, sorry. So the cover crops are the crops that are uh, not harvested for uh, fruits or other products, but rather grown to provide several environmental benefits for maintaining environmental quality and agriculture sustainability. And you can grow cover crops in several time, uh, um, any time of the year, but in my study, we are focusing on the winter cover crops. So the Tom cover crop is not new. It's, um, it went in peak in literature around uh, 1960, which you can see here in the figure, and then it suddenly dropped down. Uh, any guesses from the students why it dropped down? Uh, well, uh, because people use cover crop at that time, mainly for weed suppression, and the uh, arrival of the uh, pesticides um, caused it to drop down. But uh, now there is an uh, increase in interest again. So you can see here, in, oh, sorry. And you can see here uh, in the figure in 2012, um, there was 10 million acres planted with cover crops, which was increased by 50% to uh, 15 million acres in 2017, which is um, which was still just 5.1% of the uh, total harvested cropland. So the crop reduction, uh, cover crop reduction is still low, but it's increasing. So why there is in increasing interest in cover crops? So because we get several benefits from them. Uh, like uh, increase in soil uh, water infiltration, uh, uh, reduction in the soil compaction, increase in number of the beneficial organisms like ordomes or uh, mycorrhizal fungi, increase in number of the beneficial insects, a reduction in soil erosion through the rainfall, etc. Uh, there are many problems in uh, the co growing cover crops because they have not been bred for. And winter survival is one of the main problem in winter cover crops, limiting the uh, options for winter uh, cover crops. And uh, there are several factors that affect the winter survival, such as location where you grow, the temperature and the climatic condition, there are environmental conditions, such as the snow accumulation and management practices, such as um, like planting date and uh, species and the cultivar you choose. For my study, we are uh, focusing on several approaches uh, for increasing the winter survival. Uh, one of my uh, approaches is national cover crop trial to identify genotype by environment interaction and uh, to identify the uh, main pa environmental parameters that are um, driving the uh, well, winter survival and also provide some local recommendation. Uh, so uh, for this study, uh, uh, this study was conducted in 2016 to 2018, and we had 19 locations. Uh, um, uh, sorry, sorry. Where, where did it go? Sorry, sorry for that. And so um, there were 19 locations, and uh, these are all plant material center uh, sites. Uh, and we had eight species, red clover, crimson clover, hairy weight, winter pea, blanza clover, daikon radius, uh, uh, cereal rye, and black oats. And for all of these species, we had around eight cultivars. And uh, I've been doing analysis for this. I'm close to getting it done. I'm not done yet. So, <laughs> so my second approach is um, genotype by environment by management study. And we are looking at the effect of planting the uh, genotype and cropping system and the winter survival of the winter pea. So for this study, my first factor is planting date. Usually for most of the uh, annual cover crops, if you plant early, then it's better because uh, like here you can see in the, 
sorry, I'm not used to this. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so if so, if you plant early, uh, so you'll get like more cover. Uh, like you can see in the figures, uh, I got it from the Mirsky et al. Um, um, et al. study. So, but for winter pea, if you plant it early, then it transitions from rosette to upright growth habit, leading to reduced winter survival. The other factor I'm dealing with is the uh, cropping system. Um, so it's monoculture versus mixer. Generally, uh, if you grow the cover crops in the mixer, you get uh, more um, benefits. Um, but if you look at the two plants growing together, there is uh, more competition between them. Um, but if you grow, uh, um, if you if you grow uh, legume cover crop like winter pea with the uh, cereals, then it increases the winter survival uh, of the um, uh, of the legumes like winter pea. And um, the other factor I'm looking is um, the looking at the uh, precision of the drone against visual estimation for uh, winter survival and uh, predicting early prediction of the final biomass or crop performance uh, for farmers so that they can uh, predict early and dis decide whether to keep the crop or discard it. Uh, so for this, uh, study, I have three locations in New York, North Dakota, and Minnesota. Uh, I have four planting dates, uh, starting late August and planting in every two weeks interval. And I have four cultivars and I have two cropping system, monoculture versus biculture, uh, which is, um, the, we have mixture plus only in the New York. And my drone study is also only in the New York. And uh, I have some preliminary, uh, preliminary results from the first year. Uh, this is uh, the biomass in New York. Um, I use a mixed model and uh, accounted from, for some special variation. Uh, and uh, if you look at the figure, the different color represent the uh, different planting dates. And uh, you can see uh, the winter survival, sorry, the biomass, final biomass was greater for planting day two and three. Uh, there was a similar trend for winter survival in Minnesota. Like you can see for planting day two and three, there was a higher winter survival, except for the wild winter, which had the uh, higher winter survival at planting day four. Um, so there is uh, there was like interaction going on for the, uh, cultivar by planting date. And uh, one thing I wanted you to see is that for all these uh, all these uh, combinations, the winter survival was not so high. Uh, the maximum was 70% uh, here um, for the blaze. And in our North Dakota site, the average winter survival was below nine below 20%. So um, these are the most common cultivars that are grown uh, now. So um, that's all we have. Uh, we're doing. Uh, we will have our another approach, a genome-wide association study for low temperature tolerance in winter peas. Um, we want to find a new genetic variation uh, so that they, um, uh, so that we can, uh, so that it would help us to uh, develop a new cultivar that would be able to survive in the northern regions. So for this study, uh, I'm planning to use USDA single plant plus collection plus other uh, some other USDA and cover crop breeding network lines um, and use a growth chamber, which is supposed to arrive soon. Uh, and uh, planning to, so this USDA single plant plus collection uh, uh, was um, already genotyped, but I will be genotyped the, genotyped the rest of the other sessions. And uh, I'm planning to use uh, ion leakage is one of the main methods to detect the uh, cold damage. So uh, moving forward, our another approach is recurrent selection for low temperature germination and vigor in cereal rye. Uh, so uh, for uh, most of the common uh, summer cash crop, uh, they're harvested uh, late in the fall. And uh, so it leads to um, small planting window uh, for a cereal rye, like you can plant like, uh, like around October and uh, it decreases the uh, like amount of cover and overall benefits from the cereal rye. 
So we want to conduct this study so that we can identify uh, new systems that can fit, uh, um, so that, that can have good, um, good germination and vigor even when you plant late and fit better fit in the current crop rotation practice. So for this study, I'm planning to use uh, half safe families from our nursery and uh, I'm planning to do recurrent selection um, moving uh, one to forward the generation in the field and in the uh, greenhouse uh, and do my final trial with uh, two um, generations uh, in 2024. So uh, uh, this, this is my brief uh, overall study. I want to thank my committee members, Dr. Moore and everyone in my committee, uh, Cover Crop Breeding Network members, everyone in the Moore lab, and uh, Cover Crop Breeding Network, our collaborators, my funding, uh, and everyone who is here to listen to me. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm open to questions. <laughs> oh, sorry. Do you um, take, like, when uh, in, like, the spring with these cover crops, do you take, like, the date when you score winter survival? Oh, e yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm curious is certain since you have four different kind of crops do certain ones depending on how the winter go or how they survive in the winter like out compete each other at different rates uh, or not compete each other but you know maybe grow at different rates depending on the overwintering um, of the year. Okay, if I understood correctly, so you said that is the if I see different pattern for different cultivars. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, of course, like some of them have like high vigor, some of them are like tall type and they have higher biomass and uh, like uh, some, like I have monoculture versus mixer in mixer. Yeah, I am seeing like less damage okay. and, and the one uh, with like more, uh, more vigor, more biomass. I, I think, yeah, I'm seeing like less damage on them. Uh, um, yeah, uh, but yes. So the winter pea you were growing in Minnesota is, are those four cultivars typically grown there or was that really pushing their limit of a cold climate that they could be grown in? Uh, so yeah, you mean, are they really growing? Uh, right, so is it really common for people to grow winter pea versus a different crop or like those specific cultivars in Minnesota or are they more adapted to say, somewhere further south that still gets cold, like Iowa, but not maybe as I, frigid as. Yeah, so winter pea, uh, it's not more common uh, to grow. I would say people usually grow the spring type. Uh, I think that is the one of the reason, like we don't have the winter cultivars mm -hmm. that can add up to higher elevation yet. Uh, but yeah, so like we are trying it mainly for the cover crop purpose. Yeah, because it's beneficial to have them instead of putting it fallow or always just having the cereal rye there. Uh, I hope I answer. All right, thank you, Raksha. Um, thank you, Margie, for that introduction. I really appreciate it. Again, I'm Savannah Dale from the Van Eck and Gore Labs. And today I'll be talking about the work that I've been doing in the Van Eck Lab with CRISPR. Um, looking at the role of with analytes and in insect interactions. So to just give you an overview, first I'll talk about a little bit of the background and motivation behind this project. And then we'll talk about the with natural variation of with analytes and a couple different species of physlis. Next, um, I will give a little bit of a brief background on using CRISPR Cas9 to produce um, or to disrupt Physlis grisea insect resistance, and then looking at how we use the mutants from that process in insect bioassays to actually look at the insect resistance phenotypes. And then I'll end with the current work as well as a summary. So to start out with, Physlis is a genus within Solanaceae that contains over 120 different species. And of these, many produce edible and often delicious fruit. Um, in particular, in my work, I'm really interested in two different physicalist species, 
The first is Physalis grisea, which is also known as ground cherry, which we have on the left on this slide, the smaller fruit. And then additionally, Physalis peruviana, also known as goldenberry, which is on the right. Goldenberry has a lot of economic importance, especially in Colombia and other South American countries. Um, and we're really interested in it because a lot of food companies have predicted a 40% increase in demand in this crop in the US in the coming years, which is really exciting. However, susceptibility to herbivore damage is really a large obstacle in the successful adoption of this crop in the US. Um, and this is something this, this species hasn't been improved for insect resistance, and that's what I'm really interested in. In particular, um, this is highly susceptible to Lama deterophila, which is the three-lined potato beetle. Um, they're pretty cute, I think, personally, um, but they cause phytophagous damage, so they chew on leaf tissue in, as both larvae and adults. And the adults lay their, their eggs on the plants and the larvae hatch out, eat some leaves, crawl into the soil where they pupate, and then they'll reemerge as, as adults. Um, and overall, this insect is a specialist on Solanaceae. Um, one really interesting thing that our previous work in the lab has shown us is that Physalis grisea is much less susceptible to herbivory by Eldaterophila um, and has a lot less damage than Peruviana. So we really want to understand what the difference in this resistance phenotype between these two species is and um, potentially use this knowledge to improve Peruviana in the future. So we hypothesized that specialized metabolites would be contributing to this variation in resistance phenotypes between the two species. And in particular, we're really interested in this group of sterile chemicals called withanolides. And this is a large group of compounds. There are over 120 that have been identified in fistless species, but they are um, restricted to only about 13 genera. Um, so they're pretty highly specialized. And they have been shown not in Physalis peruviana or grisea, but in other species to have insect antifeedant activity. Um, and another thing that makes them a really good or a really interesting target for us is that they have chemotherapeutic uses and also um, anti-inflammatory activity, which means that they are very beneficial for human health and have a lot of medicinal value as well. So moving on, um, early in this project, before I even joined the lab, um, the lab looked at the metabolite composition between Physalis grisea and Physalis peruviana. And here on the left, we have um, um, a PLSDA plot um, looking at general specialized metabolite makeup of these two different species. And we have two different clusters um, one representing Grisea and one representing Peruviana. And this just shows that there is variation in metabolite profiling. Um, additionally, from this data, we were able to retrieve a cluster of withanolide ions from this and able to show that there was an intensity fold change between Grisea and Peruviana for these, um, with red representing withanolides that are in higher abundance in Grisea than they are in Peruviana. So since we've shown that there is this natural variation, what we wanted to do was break this resistance phenotype in Physalis grisea. And the way that we did that was by using CRISPR-Cas9 to target key genes in the withanolide biosynthetic pathway. We first started out by targeting this gene, 24-ISO, which is the known committed step in the biosynthetic pathway. In an effort to um, recover mutants that had um, a different withanolide profile from the wild type and ideally a reduced withanolide abundance. And we were able to successfully do that. We were able to recover mutant lines um, that had overall reduced withanolide content. These are simple bar plots looking at relative abundance of withanolides between the wild type on the right and the 24 ISO mutant lines on the left. And this is just looking at three with analyte compounds. 
um, that have known uh, chemical structures. And as you can see, there is a large reduction in withanolides. So from there, we actually wanted to look at the insect herbivory phenotypes that um, we would see with these mutants when compared to wild type. And to do this, going back to the cute little three-line potato beetles, um, we took entire leaves from both our mutants and our controls and placed them in petri dishes and added L. daterophila beetles to these. And we got some really interesting results. Um, first, we found that adults consumed more leaf area on the mutants with reduced with analytes than they did on the wild type, which is what we expected. So that was really exciting to see. And then um, we also found that L. daterophila laid more eggs on the mutants when compared with the wild type. So this is suggesting that these with analytes potentially have different mechanisms through the, which they deter or confer insect resistance. Um, but the problem with this experiment is that this was using entire leaves. So we couldn't separate out with analytes from the other endogenous specialized metabolites that were present in the plants. And because the beetles are specialized on solanaceae, we expect that they are potentially partially adapted to consuming with analytes. So moving forward, we performed leaf painting bioassays um, in which we extracted with analytes from wild type Physalis grisea and painted these onto leaf discs. And then we performed experiments using Trichopalusia E, which is the cabbage looper, um, and no choice bioassays. And we also used both a high and a low concentration of with analytes to see if we could have a variation in our, our results. And we got very, very strong results from the study, which was exciting. Um, we found that the with analyte treatment did significantly affect larval survival. Um, and most importantly, the with analyte treatments significantly reduced larval survival after 48 hours. Um, this is really exciting, but I really wanted to know why. Were they dying? Are the with analytes toxic? Were they just not eating the tissue? So I looked further at this information. And here in this bar plot, I have separated the data by each treatment in each of these boxes. And then within each treatment, I looked at the larvae that ate and those that did not eat. And in green, we have the larvae that survived, the number of larvae survived. And in gray, the top stacks, the number of larvae that perished. Um, this is pretty striking in and of itself. Overall, most of the larvae didn't eat anything on either of the with analyte treatments, whereas about half of the larvae did consume some leaf tissue on the wild type. Um, and we, I was able to show that there was a significant difference in the number of larvae that actually ate any tissue at all between these treatments. And then additionally, there was a significant difference between the number of larvae that ate and did not eat but even within the treatments as well. So this was really exciting. Um, but there are still more questions to be asked here. Uh, we still don't know exactly which with ally compounds have the most important or the largest effects on these resistance phenotypes. And um, we also don't know their exact mechanisms still, even though we do have a better understanding. So moving forward, and this is what I'm currently working on, is using CRISPR-Cas9 editing, again, to target different genes in the biosynthetic pathway. And in particular here, I'm targeting branch points of the pathway um, in an effort to produce a collection of mutants that have varying with analyte profiles. And using these mutants, I will be doing with analyte profiling work to be able to identify um, different with analytes that are in higher or lower abundance in these mutants um, when compared with wild type. And I will also be performing more insect bioassays, in particular, like the leaf painting bioassay, where I'm really just looking at with analytes. And I will be correlating this data to be able to identify which with analytes, hopefully, are having the largest impact on the insect activity. So in summary, we have shown that with analyte profiles do differ between Grisea and Peruviana. Um, 
disrupted 24 isomutants, show increased uh, l deterophila activity. Um, through our leaf painting bioassays, we were able to show that with analytes do um, reduce teeny larval survival and uh, reduce feeding. And finally, we know that more research is needed to fully understand the role of withanalides in this interaction. And with that, I would like to thank all of the members of my committee, Mike Gore, Joyce Van Eck, Jennifer Thaler, and Gaurav Mohi, as well as the Van Eck Lab, particularly Nathan Reem, who did a lot of work on this project early on, um, our collaborators in the Thaler Lab, especially Julie Davis, who helped with a lot of this work, Christophe Duply, who did a lot of the, of the biochemistry in this work, uh, Bennett Schroeder or Bennett Fox from the Schroeder Lab, as well as the DTI staff for taking care of my plants. Yes. And I'd like to take any questions. Yeah, Kevin. Hey, talk Savannah. Um, so it's surprising in your um, with analyte treatment on the leaf test when you paint it on that the low with analyte treatment was you didn't see an intermediate survival between the high and the wild type. That's a really good question. And moving forward, when I conduct more bioassays, I think I would use a lower concentration with analytes to see if I could get that intermediate phenotype. How many I, higher was the high treatment than the low? Um, it was about twice as much. I don't remember exactly. Um, but I also think that it would be good because these were not concentrations that were mimicking wild type concentrations, what we would see. And that's something I would like to do moving forward. Yeah, great. Amy? What's like the typical survival rate you'd expect to see? Like it was, I felt like half of them died in the control. Is that what you normally see in a bioassay experiment or no choice experiment like that? Yeah, thank you. So the question is, what is the typical die off rate for these insects? Um, that's a really good question. And for that particular experiment, we were looking at, um, Trichoplusia knee, which is a generalist on Physalis. Um, and I would expect that there would be a reasonable amount of die-off. I don't know, and that's a really good question. Um, but because it is a generalist, I don't expect it to perform as well as it would on potential other host plants. Um, yes, Mark. Are with analytes toxic to humans? Um, as far as I know, no, they are used in a lot of different medicinal applications, which is why they could potentially be a good breeding um, target. But I don't, I haven't read anything, but I don't know if, you know, you're drinking straight with analytes and high <laughs> concentrations, what that would do to you. But we can eat these plants. We eat the, we eat the fruit and it's fine. So. Probably not. <laughs> there is um, one moss species in particular that lays its, the larvae eat the fruit of this plant. Um, and it's actually a specialist and is adapted to eat with analytes and uses those um, to strengthen its immune system. So that's a really interesting case. And I'm not working with that, but there are a couple people who are. Yes, Saren. Do you know if analytes have any other functions within the plant life or insect system? Yeah, that's a great question. Do with analytes have other function in the plant besides insect resistance? Um, in short, I don't know, but these aren't super well studied as of yet. Most of um, the literature on with analytes is looking at their benefits for human health. Um, so not as far as I know, but it would be a really good question. Yes, Jean-Luc. Um, so there's this difference in resistance and you, you're, you're studying with analyze, with analyze in particular, but could there be a whole range of other secondary metabolites that play a role in the resistance? And if so, how would you go about finding out about that? Yeah, absolutely. I, so the question was, are there other metabolites that could be playing a role in insect resistance? I would say definitely yes. Um, in general, we expect that there is... Um, the word is escaping me, but lots of metabolites are working together to, uh, for um, co-adaptation purposes with their insect pests and that sort of thing. So the answer is yes. That's why we ended up doing the bioassays extracting with analytes specifically to be able to separate out that information. Um, and 
it's a really good question, but that, that's a huge question because there are so many different metabolites. Um, so that's not something I'll be pursuing, but it's a good question. Okay. Thank you very much. Awesome, cool. Well, to, thank you, Charlie, for that introduction. Again, my name is Elise Tomaszewski and I'm part of the Vanek and Giovanni Labs. And today I'm really excited to share the work that I've been doing over the past few months to characterize the abscission zone of Fistulus crusea. For a bit of background, like Savannah, I also work on Fistulus crusea, which is a fruit crop species in the Solanaceae family that's also part of tomato and pepper are included. This Fistulus crusea produces small sweet fruit, but has high rates of fruit abscission or fruit drop shown in this picture here, hence the name ground cherry. So, this fruit drop problem is a problem on the large scale farming side of things because fruit dropped on the ground cannot be sold to the market, so you're reducing profits for farmers. Therefore, I would like to develop improved germplasm lines with reduced fruit drop utilizing a CRISPR Cas9 gene editing technique. I'm also using Fistulus grisea as a model species to study the fruit, fruit drop genetics that are underlying it to control the fruit drop problem. So, fruit drop, as I've mentioned before, or uh, told in the literature is called abscission. So fruit abscission can be defined as the shedding of a plant organ along a boundary of predetermined cells. There are classic examples in nature, such as this leaf drop phenotype here uh, from deciduous trees in North America. But then there's also the fruit drop problem, which I am studying. Evolutionarily, this is really important for plants because you want to disperse your seeds for the next generation. However, this is a problem for farmers and we tend to select away from fruit drop. So to get us all oriented with the structures that I will be talking about for the rest of the presentation, I have a couple of diagrams. On the left is an immature Fistulus grisea fruit. The fruit is surrounded by an inflated calyx and the structure that connects the fruit to the plant is called the pedicel. Zooming in further on the pedicel, we have three regions. We have the proximal pedicel here up top, which remains connected to the plant and is green does not senesce. This is unlike the distal pedicel, which remains connected to the fruit and it senesces upon maturation. The zone that is between the proximal and the distal pedicel is considered the abscission zone, and it is characterized by small cytoplasmically dense cells in other species. However, in Fistulus grisea, the cellular structure of the, the abscission zone has not been investigated previously. Therefore, I am trying to develop a protocol to visually characterize the abscission zone cells of Fistulus grisea fruit. I want to do this to help understand the differentiation and development of the abscission zone. So now I will go into two different methods that I've used to image my abscission zone cells. The first was embedding my pedicels in a compound called Optimal Cutting Temperature Compound, or OCT for short. This is a pedicel or Fistulus grisea pedicel on the left at 25 days post anthesis. For reference, the pedicel will detach around 30 days post anthesis, so it is about five days out from detaching. On the left is where the fruit would be connected to the pedicel, and on the right is where it would be connected to the plant. On the macroscopic scale, this is what this pedicel looks like, and you can see that senescence has started to occur via the yellowing, and there is a very distinct abscission zone that you can be seen by the naked eye. However, on the microscopic level, the only indications of an abscission zone are these two zones of separation. Again, what I wanted to say is that the abscission zone cells in other species like tomato have zones of smaller cells that are very easily distinguishable from the surrounding parenchyma cells, shown in tomato here by the red box. This is not what I am seeing in my fistulus pedicel via the OCT, and what I think is going on is that these sections that I took using OCT were quite thick, whereas the protocol here was on the right for the tomato was using a paraffin embedded protocol. Therefore, I wanted to optimize a paraffin embedded protocol for my fistulous pedicels. After a lot of trial and error, I was able to do so, and I would like to get us oriented again. So on the left is where it would be connected to the plant this time, and on the right is where it would connect to the fruit. This dark zone here is just an artifact from sectioning. The pedicel is not laying flat on the side, so that is not the abscission zone. In fact, I think that the abscission zone is indicated here by the red arrows. These cells are much smaller than the parenchyma cells surrounding them on either side. You can also see that the abscission zone cells create a concave arc where you can imagine that the distal pedicel will detach from the proximal pedicel on the left. 
I then wanted to zoom in further on these abscission zone cells to look at any cellular structure of them and what was going on further. So to zoom in, again, you can notice the abscission zone cells marked here by the bracket. They're much smaller than the parenchyma cells that surround them, either on the left or the right. What else I notice is that the cell wall seemed to be degraded of these abscission zone cells. There's also higher intracellular space. So what this indicates to me is that cell separation has started to occur. However, this pedestal here is 21 days post anthesis or about three weeks. And the one that I showed previously was 25. So I would expect that about four days later, I would see the separation be more prominent. What I've been showing currently are what are called radial sections. So what I'm doing is splitting the pedestal down the middle and or the radius, and you are getting indications of the vasculature, which is on the previous slide. However, I wanted to see what the abscission zone looked like on a more tangential section that's closer to the outside of the pedestal. So I was able to do so. And again, in this picture, I'm not seeing any indications of the vasculature. So I think that the pedestal is closer to the outside or the section is closer to the outside of the pedestal. In this case, I see that the abscission zone cells span from the top to the bottom. So with this, these last two sections, I was able to think about how this incision zone is structured in the pedestal. And what I'm thinking is that the incision zone creates this circular disc about 10 cell layers wide that encompasses the vasculature. In this case, it would be this blue uh, tube going through the pedestal. This, however, is in stark contrast with tomato pedestals. So tomato pedestals, and this one is a breaker, uh, or it was taken from a breaker fruit. It, the abscission zone spans from the top to the bottom, and it also spans across the vasculature here in the middle. So what this indicates to me is that abscission zone structures vary across the plant kingdom. Lastly, I want to indicate that the abscission zone cells seem to differentiate at a specific time point. So what you were seeing before were about three week old pedestals. And what I'm showing now is a seven day post anthesis pedestal. And I'm not seeing that classic abscission zone cells. They're not differentiating to be smaller. There might be some differentiation towards the bottom, especially, but again, it's not spanning from the bottom towards the vasculature. So I'm trying to understand why this is, which brings me to my next steps. I want to do a time series using wild type Fistulus crisea and tomato pedicels to understand at what point these abscission zone cells are differentiating. I expect them to be at any point between seven and 20 days post anthesis. Now that I have been able to optimize a paraffin embedded protocol and have high resolution of my abscission zone cells, I will then use these for my CRISPR mutants where I have two different sections of the CRISPR lines that I'm taking forward. The first are abscission zone de development mutant lines. And in this one, where I what I expect on the microscopic level is that the abscission zone cells never differentiate. I don't see an abscission zone in these pedicels. However, on my other lines that are targeting cell separation genes, what I expect to happen is that there isn't an abscission zone differentiating. So I see small cells, but the cell separation that I zoomed in on earlier in the presentation will either not happen or it will be delayed. So in summary, I have generated the first images of the Fistulus crusea abscission zone using an optimized paraffin embedded protocol. It looks to me as though the abscission zone does not span across the vasculature as it does in tomato. And it also seems to differentiate at a specific time point. And my future work is to look at my CRISPR mutants that I have generated using this optimized paraffin embedded protocol. With that, I would like to acknowledge all of my committee members, Joyce Vanek, Jim G. Vanoni, and Adrian Roeder, as well as all of the members of the Vanek Lab, specifically Savannah Dale and Victoria Swiler, who was an RU student this summer with me. I would also like to thank all of the members of the G. Vanoni Lab, specifically Julia and Eamon for all of their help. And a very large thank you to Sergey from Maria Harrison's lab in, at BCI for all of his help with optimizing the paraffin protocol. Lastly, I would also like to thank the BTI Greenhouse staff. They are great and help maintain all of my plants. And with that, I will take any questions. Yes. So when you compare tomato with raspberry and abscission zone, when you say tomato, do you mean squash with little wild progenitors or cultivated? Uh, right now I'm looking at cultivated. So that is one thing I want to do is use one of the more uh, un or not domesticated versions. So to see if this abscission zone it spans across the vasculature as well. A similar question. Do you think that the abscission zone cells will eventually cut through the vascular system, like mm -hmm. you know, like you think of the different time points? Yeah. Um, comparison versus different. That's perfect. I 
I have that question and I think, I'm not sure what the answer is going to be. So the task to me to separate the vasculature seems huge. I'm not sure exactly how that happens yet. Maybe the cells do expand and crush the xylem and phloem. But one problem that I'm having is that these pedicels, when they are detached or almost about to detach, you can breathe and they fall off. So trying to embed something like that around 25 days or later is very difficult. So if I can figure that out, I'll give you great images, but hopefully I can see that it does span across or it doesn't. That's what I'll be under trying to understand. Mm -hmm. Do other fistula species have the same fruit drop problem? No. So it actually varies across the uh, fistula um, species. You have goldenberry, which Savannah talked about, and it doesn't have an abscission zone at all. So it doesn't drop. I think that's also probably why these goldenberry are probably going to be in the market faster than ground cherry, but maybe I'll catch that up with them. So we'll see. Okay. Yeah. Are you doing, so you have uh, CRISPR line, so you've been thinking about like the genetic cause of it. Are you yeah. doing any sort of mapping or comparing across other fistula species? <laughs> I think that's a whole other PhD project. I totally <laughs> wanted to, but that would take me another PhD project and I don't have time to that. But yeah, with goldenberry not having an abscission zone, there must be genetics behind this on why fistulus grisea does, but Peruviana does not. So yes, you're on the right, I also thought of that. <laughs> okay, Matthew? Um, have you, or do you see similarities in the long emission paragraphing of the cells and tomato do you think that they're almost different? Yeah, I, so I'm not shown here any, on any of my slides, but with tomato, you do have a lot of ethylene release towards ripening. I was able to measure that, and I am seeing ethylene being released in my fiscal scrisea. So I've also applied these exogenous hormones as well, which I'm not including in these slides. Um, and they are responding similar to exogenous either ethylene, which was increasing abscission, or it's delaying abscission when I applied ox. So they seem to be related to tomato. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.